Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Goodman with Art Matcher, the mobile app which will bring innovation to the art industry and is coming to you soon. While we work hard to build and release this app, we'll be talking art with some of the industry's most interesting and knowledgeable people. Whether you're an art aficionado or this is all new to you, we'll be here to provide valuable insight and hilarious good stories. Hope you enjoy our chat today. Welcome to another episode of Art Matcher, the podcast. In the studio today, a special guest, friend, colleague at some point, still colleague if we're going to do some work together. Always. <laughs> Josh Hashemzadeh. And now I can finally say his name after several years of friendship. It's, it's been a good decade, but it's a, it's a steep learning curve for it's sure. A steep but I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'll never forget the first video. Uh, someone was doing a video of us. <laughs> oh, I remember that. <laughs> and I butchered his name. That was my was first like, show too. It was tough. It was tough. Well, we were drunk. We were pretty drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what we're saying? I don't think we were of age. But <laughs> maybe we were. Maybe. I, I can't remember drunk. a show that we weren't drinking back in the day. <laughs> back in the day. Well, after hard work. Uh, Josh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, so my background, I mean, as you kind of hinted, I'm, I'm an artist, uh, entrepreneur, designer, writer, you know, all the above. But my background um, was actually going to school at San Francisco Art Institute, which we connected through a mutual friend. Um, and basically, I've just been exploring painting and largely like language based uh, depictions. So studying like concrete poets and, um, you know, early conceptualists in the 1970s in, in L.A. And that kind of inspired me to just make work that was really driven by like material process and and thinking about like how materials create meaning over time. Um, and so I've just kind of built a studio practice around that for a while. Uh, and after I come back to L.A., ran a gallery for a little bit after, you know, we did our kind of thing here at MRG and, and got things kind of off the ground. Um, and so that was, that was great. So I kind of got like a background in the arts, um, and then moved into like curation and, you know, just managing the business end of the gallery and learning kind of the art world on, on that kind of perspective. And then now I'm kind of transitioned back into art, you know, after, after COVID and everything like that. So I've kind of come full circle <laughs> a little bit. Um, I think we all, we all have that moment where it's just like, you're going to go back to what, what feeds you. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And it's interesting. I think it's. I think something that you've always had uh, from the get go is kind of like this uh, left and right brain. I'm forgetting which one's the creative one, but <laughs> yeah, that's my dyslexic brain is forgetting. Yeah, you know, <laughs> um, for sure. <laughs> it's just interesting because you don't find too many artists who are interested in kind of the business aspect. And for sure, I think for me, what got me interested in business, I think culturally, it was like just something I grew up with, like you're going to have to be uh, self-dependent. Yeah, you got to survive, bro. <laughs> no, but I, I, I think yeah. some artists, I mean. I mean, you had a lot of siblings too. Yeah, and, and we're not a stranger to, at least for yourself, you know, like, you know, when you have parents who are like, you know, this is, you must find your own way in this world. Because I find in the art world, this comes to a shock to some people, but a lot of successful artists come from families of privilege like pretty uh, i think more often than not i mean it's like almost impossible in terms like when you see like the big headline title shows it, it's pretty hard to find someone that didn't come from some kind of privilege or the gallery itself right is being operated yeah. from a place of privilege so it's like the whole institutional idea of representation right now is like largely divided from like the kind of ethos that artists have, I think coming out of uh, like undergrad or grad school, or even just like working in their studios where it's like very removed kind of from that business end of things. And I think that's a shame because they start to become disadvantaged and they don't really understand why or even how that is. And so it just drives this like really, oh, sorry, drives this really like weird divide um, between these two camps that should otherwise really be the same, the same camp. I think one of the tough things is, uh, and from my experience of kind of nurturing and building certain artists up that I've had in my, in my tender career of, uh, now it's going on 15 years, 15. Damn. Yeah. It seems like soon our careers will be able to drink. I know <laughs> that's kind of scary to think about. Um, they'll be able to vote. <laughs> I think by the next minister, <laughs> next, uh, campaign, <laughs> <laughs> when you're not challenged with having to think about okay, where's my rent coming from? Where, how's these bills going to get paid? You can really tap into kind of a euphoric creative zone in some sense because, 
and, and it's interesting artists who they're living in the real world, meaning like, oh man, like I got to pay rent. This is real. I think that influences their work too. For sure. But like to have that, like what I call like cloud, like, you know, you could just be in total create mode, create mode of just like, you know what I want to put, I want to make a, a cow with a space helmet floating through the galaxy. <laughs> yeah. No one, and no one's going to say shit about it. <laughs> no, but it, it's, it's interesting because yeah. like, you know, I'm not here to ever kind of like knock someone down. Like you can't knock someone's, you know, what what would you call it? Uh, aesthetic? No, not aesthetic. Like their their socioeconomic background. If oh, you will. for sure. Yeah. No, it's not saying to knock. I'm, and I'm not saying to to artists who may be coming from somewhere that's like not privileged that hey, like this is not a space for you. I, th- I think it's like quite the opposite. I, I think like these artists don't really understand the perspective and their ability to navigate that space and how important it is that they participate in it. Um, because I think when you get just that kind of homogenized group of artists who maybe came from wealth or whatever, and they're just kind of doing this on their own MO, which is fine. And there's, there's no knock against that, as, as you said, but it, it does start to dissipate some of the opportunities for younger artists or people who are coming from different backgrounds. I mean, I know that my dad, I mean, when he immigrated here, he wanted to pursue film, you know, American dream and all, all these things. There was no way in hell. I mean, <laughs> like bringing a family from Iran and all, all this stuff. I mean, there was just no way, especially after the revolution, that they were going to be able to like do that for themselves. And so it really became, you know, you kind of have whatever passions and who you are as like one part of your life. And then you have here's the an, reality of life. Here's <laughs> an interesting your job. question. If you could live in the time when your dad was kind of bringing you up, Mm-hmm. Do you think you would dominate that era? What do you mean, like go back as a, as a young child? Like, no, imagine <laughs> you now uh-huh. living in that era. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's definitely different circumstances. You know, like if I was born here, I think like I probably could have done more. And if I had parents that were born here, probably could have done more. But you know, I like to think that I'm still going to dominate in this era. <laughs> no, it's like I, I always I always kind of compare. You know, when people when when the generation like above us is like. Oh man, you guys had it so easy. I'm like, I would crush you guys with the hunger that oh, I have man. now because I think like right now we're living in the most competitive time ever. There's no For everything's sure. out. For sure. You know, the I'm competing against the kid in Istanbul right now who's doing TikToks. Like we're competing right now. <laughs> like the fact that like what people need to realize about this podcast, like this is work that we're not getting paid for right now. We're just putting out that content. We're taking time out of our day to do this. For sure. And I, and I think any artist is doing that, right? No, like, every artist is doing yeah. it. But I think it's like now there's just all these platforms to put this information out there that it's like. Our, our parents were certainly not as global. I mean, there, there was just not the infrastructure for that. So when you were competing, you were competing against your like. Hometown. Your hometown. Yeah, your hometown. And like if you lived in like a hometown that was like somewhere in the Midwest, I mean, it was like a really small I'm dominating pool. Sherman Oaks, just so you know. Just like, so you know. There still Sherman hasn't Oaks. been a gallery that has we're, laid on my turf. We're waiting for the statue to, to get ushered in. Um, <laughs> no, when but you think about that. like 100%. It's like, and, and that's, that's what drives us to get better, right? It's like without them having done what they did, and that generation leading up to like the internet and digital sort of you know beginnings that we we experienced, you know now now we're here where we're producing content not just in like a local ecosystem but a global ecosystem, and that's like crazy because now it's gone from like oh there's a couple thousand people maybe in this in this arena we're, we're, we're to like millions millions, yeah. millions yeah like and, if here's the crazy thing about it is let's say we um this this podcast went viral and it got a million listeners that's not nothing to sure. boast about i'd be boasting about it. I'd be posting that no shit. no you can you can <laughs> boast about it but some people are like i go viral like every day yeah i mean like every day talk about disassociative uh <laughs> no <laughs> mental we have, states, we have, we have but... like this society where like numbers are so skewed today and i think in the art world they've always been skewed and it's funny that's to true. me, when you, when someone comes to me and goes, "Oh my gosh, that NFT sold for sixty nine million. I'm like, "That's light work, light That's work." Light. Was I that mean, like a? Like I a saw bad Botticelli. Rothko. Yeah, no, I, I, you know, it's like it's like you and I know, like, <laughs> oh man, a Rothko, like, you know, one of those color, uh, just simple color paintings. What, what, what would that be considered? I mean, I mean Rockefeller and so those will be hundred million, yeah. No, or like, you know, a, a Jackson Pollock splatter painting. 
Yeah, I, I was just watching like a light work on a million. Hundred million more. I mean, but it, that's light. Like when I say that's a light, yeah, yeah, that's a that's light, light hundred million. Well, it's a, it's a different echelon of people, right? It's like the and it's like not even art collectors at this point. It's like asset class investors. Like they're, they're um, you know, securitizing these these assets now. So like you have Van Goghs that are essentially trading like NFTs, where you can buy, you know, oh, a digital. Van Gogh doesn't go less than fifty million. No, for sure, for sure. I'm not saying to buy like the entire piece. I'm saying like you'll buy pieces of it through digital like exchanges. So there's oh, securitizing. I've, I've, I've heard. I think Masterworks had Masterworks that, had that right program. And sure, that's interesting. But okay, let's 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 dive into NFTs. Let's let's yeah. Let's, let's, <laughs> the people, the people's art. <laughs> the people want to know about NFTs, so we're going to talk about NFTs. It's interesting to me, and I'm going to say interesting a lot on this podcast. That there are people, the people who hype it, the people who sell the news often know nothing about it. True. Yeah. I and mean, it's also so early, too, that people and are trying to figure it out. What's kind of, there is no doubt that the blockchain technology is here to stay. I believe that. It has value. 100%. When I see a flaming zombie monkey go for, let's say, $50,000. And someone's like, oh, yeah, you know, hold on to this. And like in two months, it's going to be worth a million dollars. I'm like, if you didn't collect tangible items, like you you can see the value in something tangible that no one else sees as and you see. Mm-hmm. In my book, you have no business collecting an NFT. I mean, if so, you don't say own- it again, say it again, if you... If you weren't collecting essentially what I'm saying, art, you know, yeah. whether it's figurines, paintings, comic books, and now all of a sudden you're entering the market for NFTs, for NFTs, you had no business to be in this business <laughs> and collecting. The reason why is because you don't understand the relationship of a non liquid asset, meaning when you bought that, when you bought that Batman figurine, as much as there's a huge market for Batman, you got to understand that Batman with the cape in the box. I I didn't buy figurines that are in a box. I don't right. care for figurines. In fact, the other day, someone who I met, they got me a Bob Ross <laughs> figurine. I'm not even lying. That's hilarious. And I'm contemplating, do I take the Bob Ross out or do I keep him in the box for value wise? Don't put him in a box, man. Don't no, put him in, in a box. box. No, like, you know, it has his like, little palette. <laughs> And it's interesting because collectors, when they buy these things, right, for the Bob Ross crazy collector is going to go, oh, my gosh, I want my Bob Ross like perfect the way he was came from the store. So yeah. I get the idea of why a boxed figurine would go for a would go for more money than a non box. Yeah, because if the person decides to pay a million dollars for it and they want to unbox it for the first time, they get that experience. It's like a Just- kid opening a present on Christmas day or whatever. Right. For sure. I mean, you could just take a photo of Bob Ross in the box and then just make an NFT of and it. make an <laughs> NFT. And, and then, then you, know what? you don't even need the figurine you in don't the box even, anymore. Yeah. It's so trash. <laughs> my whole philosophy is like, you have a whole new market of people getting into the collectible space that don't understand that. What's going to be interesting is that people that sold for 69 million. I need to see the crazy guy who buys it for a hundred million. For sure. And I think I think there's like a couple of things happening with this, like and, and it's really come down to like two two things that I think people are maybe like projecting onto how they think these things are going to appreciate in value. And one is that a lot of these are built off of Ethereum based tokens. And so when you're buying these assets for, you know, X amount of cryptocurrency or, or X amount of Ethereum, um, Ethereum is a huge platform that has a lot of merit and a lot of infrastructural like good, as, as you were saying, like blockchain yeah. and smart contracts. Like that, that is a sound technology that is going to be here to stay. So as that is appreciating, all these people who bought this for a couple of Ethereum or whatever, even if it's trading at the same three Ethereum, four Ethereum, whatever, now all of a sudden that asset is more. So it looks like that asset has actually gone up in value because it trades for three Ethereum, but a three Ethereum now have gone from like a thousand dollars a piece to to four thousand dollars. So it's like People, I think, are a little bit confused as to as to that. They think that if they're holding this and they've purchased it with a with an Ether wallet or or some kind of Ether based wallet, 
that, oh, wow, this asset is going up. And that might be correlationally like true for, to, to some extent, but it, it's not necessarily going to drive the resale value. And to your point, like someone- You're going to see a wipeout. I already know. Yeah, yeah. You're going to see a massive- We did. Extension. We did see like no, no, quite I'm a correction. No, no, I'm already seeing like a lot of guys who release their stuff on Nifty Gateway and they're going like, oh, like why? Like just because you were the first one to buy the hype doesn't mean there's someone who's like, oh man, I want to pay more than that. Because like we live in a society where at least our generation- Right. Uh, millennials they could speak on- are like, oh, if we missed the boat, we missed the boat. Like you and I know, let's say we missed the boat on YouTube. Like we could have, if we were doing YouTube 10 years ago, we're not like, yeah. can we be the next, you know, whatever big vlogger, whoever that is, you know, Mr. Beast or. 100%, 100%. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not, it, we, we know it's not impossible. But it's but much harder, yeah. We understand that, you know, we understand that this guy's been doing it for 10 years. And that's why he is where he's at right now. I will say we probably could have gone further with less quality like 10 years ago. For sure. I think that if you're going to do it now, it's still possible. But Just the, everything's a production. Yeah, the quality of, of whatever you're producing now just has to be. To Except the, for to Gary Vee is like, just throw out content. <laughs> just do content. Do it. Go to a garage sale. Flip a $2 pin for $10. And hey, man, there's I like the hustle of that. There's something old no, school I mean, about like, that. You know, for me, the hustle's in me. I think it's like, uh, it's it's interesting how far I've gone without technology. Without technology? Yeah, like I still haven't ever ordered anything off Amazon. That's that's a lie. I swear. That's, there's this, no... <laughs> this is a fact. I know it's it shocks people. Maybe you didn't know this. Do you have me. an Amazon account? What you, what what are you doing? That's not is that safe? Like, <laughs> dude, I don't have an Amazon account. That's bizarre. Bezos would be weeping. I haven't. Uh, well, I'll say this: my sisters, the last Amazon thing my sisters got for me, like I told my sister, <laughs> oh, you have like, family running it for you. Yeah. I was like, Naomi, can you buy me sheets off Amazon? And they were nice sheets. Not gonna lie, they were bamboo. Four star plus, yeah. Four star <laughs> plus. So going back to this NFTs. For me, my analysis on it right now, it's a money grab. Just get your bag as an artist. If you can, you can get some distribution. Just sell whatever, whatever creative thing you want. Yeah. I mean, so I've made an NFT. It's not just like you publish this and then like people are, are automatically buying. I mean, there's no, vast... I, pub I published one on Rarible and it's like Rarible. Yeah. And it's like the vast majority of whatever people are publishing is in the same way of like YouTube or anything like that. The, the vast majority of what people publish does not get picked up. It does not get headlines. It does not go for, you know, millions of dollars. Yeah. It really is it like just the one percent on the marketplace. Yeah, for sure. And, and that's and that's fine. And I think for me, it's like if you see artists who gain a following, and then they start like clothing or like drop shipping or something like that. It's like it's the same kind of idea. Yeah, it's just an extension. On, if, if you got if you got a hit, you're gonna make a hit probably in NFTs as well. For sure. I, I mean, I remember talking with Kenny Sharf about this in his studio about like three years ago, three four years ago, and he got invited to do this on um, Nifty Gateway, which was uh, Winklevoss Twins' yeah. his, his, his project, and they were just starting to reach out to people. And kind of testing markets out in in Asia, and they invited him to do it. And I remember, like, even Kenny Sharp at the time. I mean, none of us really knew what it was, but he, he, coming from an older generation, was like, you know, what do I have to do? And they're like, just take a photo of a character from one of your murals or something. And they had done that, and it was literally just a JPEG image that they then, you know, digitized and minted as a, as an NFT. And that thing had just sold like hotcakes in Korea and and China and. The thing that they really started to learn is like, oh, the resale of this is really where I make my money. It's not even like the initial distribution. Well, yeah, let's say in and a smart like contract, you get a 10% royalty every time in an exchange. But I think what people don't realize is me being an art dealer for so long is like, wow, but that well, exchange yeah. is really hard to do. It doesn't matter that like. So let's say I bought this Kenny Scharf uh, NFT. Yeah. For 100,000. And. uh now I paid a hundred thousand and I'm gonna go resell it. I don't know, and let's say a year. Yeah. Let's say I sell it for a hundred and forty thousand. Uh-huh. That the second sale is even more remarkable than the first sale. To some extent, yeah. But so my, my point that I was trying to make is that like if you're an artist with a following, if you already have people that are doing that with your just your artwork oh, yeah, or whatever. You're, you're made, but it doesn't you're made, matter and what. That, but what and you that's do. and that's really what 
NFTs in this state are, but I really don't think NFTs as art is like even a thing. I think people have like really run away with the headlines. Like NFTs are not meant for art. Like the way we're using them now, I think will make up less than 5% of the total marketplace of NFTs in like 10 years. It's just not what it's made for. Like we're just starting to test smart contracts. I think next you'll see music. Oh, music on. already did. Tory Lanez released his album, made a million dollars. Yeah. And so you're going to start seeing like more direct releases because it, it empowers like creatives and artists and stuff, which is great. And I think like even that, like for the music and stuff, will have to get more adopted into mainstream like streaming platforms well, his, and stuff. I, I believe his uh, his like uh, record label was like, they were so pissed. They were just like, I'm sure. I'm sure. How? Why? Yeah. And I was like, yeah, he has a crazy following. But for me, it's we live in an an age now to like become social media f- like famous whether it's through TikTok, Instagram it you just we're all about entertainment and i see a big bubble because i just don't see i see an advertisement bubble that's what i see interesting elaborate I see a lot of companies throwing money at creators that are creating content. They're getting a lot of views, but I would like to see their books if they're monetizing on that because specifically in the arts or just in general, just in general, because it can't be that there's all these creators creating contents. Let's say I'm a big brand, right? Yeah. I'm BMW and like, you know, Charlie D'Amelio. Sure. (laughs) She's a big, she does TikTok dances, whatever. Oh, she's a visionary. <laughs> she does dances. Nothing. She seems like a very sweet girl. For sure. Um, I don't see the relationship between Charlie D'Amelio and selling a BMW. I don't even <laughs> see a correlation between the ultimate driving machine or what you used to be and a BMW. I just don't. Hey, man, get a new car. That's going to want to make you dance. The people who are buying BMWs or leasing them, they're not focusing on Charlie D'Amelio. They're just not. For sure. I mean, I guess it's like depending on the niche market. It's like no, no, probably you're looking more at the niche market, disease. but it's just like people are paying these influencers, different brands, like this this brand Bang. They just want to like they're giving every every uh, every influencer their drink, and I get a drink has a lower um, it's a lower barrier entry to the market. I get it. It's a it's an yeah. energy drink. I've never had the drink at once and and maybe maybe i'm just too smart to be like i feel like i'm an easy sale when i go into places in terms of like i know what i want and if you can provide me that in the in the best experience i'm there's nothing between me and that thing unless i can't afford it for some reason well yeah but i think like that's the point of like this digital marketing is that you know it might not be right for you but generally we are seeing that like influencer marketing digital marketing direct marketing uh, you know, being able to like look at data and then provide you with exactly. But are we what becoming a society that we're that easy to sell anything to? Well, it's just that's my question. I think it's not that it's easier to sell. It's like anything to you. It's just easier to get you to like to your point. It's easier to get you to buy the things you were already looking for. But right now, marketing is getting really good at being able to find the thing that you're looking for and pairing you with it. And so your your cost of acquisition for customers and your return on investment for marketing. It's actually going up because Let it's me ask become a lot something. cheaper to, to get. When to you see a celebrity pumping an item, are you compelled to buy it? Depends on the item, depends on the celebrity, but there have been times for sure. There have, there yeah. have been. Now, can yeah. you, from your own recent history, is there one that kind of strikes you like, oh man, I saw this commercial. It was like with Bruce Willis. I definitely, I definitely like look at like Pharrell. Like I think human race and stuff like I'm, I'm into. And Pharrell is really cool. Uh, I mean, he's a, he's an exceptional uh, human being though. For sure, but it's like like there's like so that many. was that was a curveball. You threw me like a like a Kershaw curveball right now. I mean, I mean, I was not expecting Pharrell out of all people. Really? I mean, like that's I like, hate the hats. You <laughs> you hate the hats. I mean, I think I mean Tyler the Creator is another. I mean, like okay. I just think like there's a lot of great designers and artists that are out there that are also now social media like behemoths that are able to push products. Because they're just not only like better quality or good products, but because you also buy into the ethos of who they are and like what they stand for. And, you know, it just gives you a different way to like relate to brands than I think we had even 10 years ago. 
Wow. Yeah. No, I, I think it's interesting. If there was a visual artist celebrity you can uh, chat up with, who would it be? Visual artist to chat up with. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're dialing back into our domain. Josh and I, we can we can go off like, God, any topic. And it'll for get sure. pretty cerebral. So um, got to throw back into the we're on an art match or podcast. It's, it's all good. Um, well, so I, I'd probably be hitting up. I, I did the show Semblance Sunshine at the Torrance Art Museum uh, during COVID. And it was during lockdown. So I wasn't able to do any of this. So we're like 400 artists or something? No, no, no. That, that was a, a group show I did. That was Nomad uh, this, okay. this past weekend. This was like a year ago, 2020, when we were locked down. Okay. Um, it was about 18 artists, but I never got to do studio visits with them or, you know, talk about the show with them. So I'd probably like work through that list. Um, so Alex Israel would probably be like up there. Did Matt- we meet him? I thought we met him at a Gagosian show. We I did, took a photo. I did meet him uh, in the in the past, but I haven't like really been to a studio and been able to like talk work. I've seen him at lectures and things like that, but I, I'd be more interested in talking about, you know, kind of his work some of the ideas in the show and then maybe kind of what, what he's doing next. But there's a lot of people in that show that I would have met with as well, like Lauren Halsey, Matt Bass, uh, you know, Kazu Shiro. There's a lot of artists in that show that were really great. And I did have the fortunate, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to to meet some of them. But it'd be cool to just like reconnect, especially after COVID when you're just like so isolated. Wow, I thought I was going to hear like Damien Hurst or Jeff Koons. Uh, you're like, nah, they're passe. I mean, Jeff Koons, I think, has some interesting ideas they're just like not the top of my list and i think like there's just i'd rather look in my own home you know la's got like so many great artists i don't need to go do you feel la is underrepresented it has been for a long time i think like that page is turning because i think it's already been turned it for sure for sure and in, in a huge way in the last like five years la has really been put on the map and you'll you've seen even like every a-list gallery has really like either opened up an outpost Jeffrey here Deitch is here Jeffrey Deitch, Hauser and Worth. I mean, like every big player has either come out here in the form of a space or they participate now in our fair week with, yeah. with Freeze or Felix, whatever. Did you see Felix? Did you go to Felix this year? I didn't go this year. Good. Uh, it was trash. It was trash. I mean, I had some friends that went and I had some friends that did pretty well uh, there. The reason why I know it was trash is people were coming from Felix and saying that, wow, they were really impressed by the LA Art Show. I don't know. I mean, like, I I only went to the LA Art Show briefly, um, but yeah, no, I, I, mean, I can't, that's I can't crazy really speak on when that. you think about like Felix being like, this is. I I'm not sure if I'm sold on the kind of uh, the hotel space with Felix, like the kind of uh, doing it at the Roosevelt. What are your thoughts on it? I mean, I did it the first two years uh, that it was. You did it with the the gallery you were with. Yeah. So I was I was working there we had a booth i had a lot of other friends and, and people who were doing booths and projects there were you guys successful yeah actually it was like probably one of our better fairs and i think just the environment the community and just being able to see artists in that space i actually think it works better than like the white cubicles that i've seen like at the armory show and stuff like that i mean no no hate towards the armory but i mean we did that <laughs> we did that as well but um i i think like it's just nice when thinking about like an art scene in LA, it's always been kind of infused with this idea of lifestyle and this idea of wellness and all that stuff. So to have all of our art shown in these really sterile kind of like East Coast white cube spaces, nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't always feel genuine to how the work is made or how artists are even thinking about the work. So I think like, I think it's what you do in that white cube. The cool thing about white cube for is sure. you can do whatever you want in that white cube. For sure, but there's like just a different history and context to that that space. For sure, I mean that's yeah. getting really like deep into it. I mean, a lot of people ask me why do why are galleries like these kind of sterile environments? Well, I'm like we're trying to focus on the art. We're trying to focus. We're trying to create an environment, and that's why when you have installations, they're really interesting. When you take a gallery and you transform the space, for sure. I mean, I think it's the same way as like why is a like medical lab so sterile i mean it's it's like a controlled environment to achieve something here and yeah. you know, if you're trying to present something that communicates better in a white cube then like you should be able to control every element that, but you from should lighting. be able to take a white cube that's what i'm saying is like let's say your work is about you know the brazilian rainforest you know for us you can at least transform a white cube into that like meaning yes you got to bring in the greenery you got to bring in the stuff for sure, but it will never be the rain. Like it will always be something else that's trying to be that. And so I think like authenticity for sure. has become like a big part. And I think if you want to have like more genuine conversations around the work, sometimes it makes sense to put it in like an indigenous space or like a, a space that's local to the concepts that you're you're building those materials out of or you're pulling those materials out of. I have nothing against the white space. I've done you know majority of my shows in white spaces. Yeah. I've curated you know predominantly in white spaces. 
Um, but I love shows that are put on in like different architecture. You know, it's like things that have a different history that carry a different weight that have different meanings and different cultural. Uh, I think the art world though sometimes like kind of they stick their nose up in the air in terms of like if you and I we we've both done God knows how many shows, but I think I'm gonna pay the compliment or past um, the time where someone someone's like, hey Josh, I'd love I'd love for you to create uh, curate this show at this coffee shop. I mean, it depends on the coffee shop. You know, like if, if it's like, like if they have really good coffee and they're going to hook me up with a lifetime membership, that, that might be. No, but like, like I've been thinking about like, especially during COVID, right? Like, you know, you see all these small businesses and stuff like closed down and then you start thinking about like, oh, well, like where do I want to show my art and like galleries are closed. The, hold the, up, the hold up. The schlepper at the coffee shop. I'm not, I'm not, it's not about a sales thing. It's like, a, I'm no, talking about like, sales. I'm talking purely on the art right now. So it's like, if I want to do a show, like, if that coffee shop is ran by like a homie of mine or something, or that coffee shop has a mission that I think is like really good for the community, like there might be something where that's I want to collaborate different. with them. It is different, but that's, that's the way I'm thinking about it. Like for me, like during COVID, I was thinking about small business that I like to collaborate with. Does that mean I want to put painting and hang it on their wall? No, but maybe that means that I'm like a brand ambassador or a brand manager or whatever for these companies or a consultant or whatever. And we can do kind of collaborative projects together and find artistry out of that. Um, or maybe I just let it influence my art, um, you know, and, and like maybe that is the, the the end result. But I do think like the idea of how we produce art or creatively think in different environments is like getting redefined now. And it's much looser than it was like five, 10 years ago. Well, the respect that to me, it goes back to respect. I've done a hospitality placement for the last gosh, it was it was infused with the the, the inception of my career. So it's like, I'm not a stranger to placing works in coffee shops, hotels, restaurants. I still have Stanley's restaurant, which I curate. And a lot of these places, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's very perplexing to me when people are like, cause price eventually does, you know, this, this, this art is for sale and people go, huh? Like it, and it's like, why, wow, you know, you think you get all types of walks of life in a restaurant, you know, cause it's food. Right. But it's amazing how people like, there's a reason why those environments are not art galleries or they're not places where you can really appreciate it because I get it. When you go to a restaurant, you're there to eat. Yeah. If the food is not good, but you're just not in that mindset. You know, it also just showed me like, well, some of the art I place, you, you you can't help but look at it because you're like, oh, wow. I mean, that, but it's that, just not the reason that you're there. Like, to your no, point. it's not the reason. It's not the reason you're there. But yeah. Like you're hungry. <laughs> there's a lot of people like this is a fishbowl effect. We get 250 walk bys. Uh, I get at least 250 walk bys a day on the boulevard. I'll be lucky if I get a single soul walk in here. The only people who walk in here are artists artist primarily right and someone who's been invited to come here and it doesn't matter if i have an open sign come in people this is not an intimidating space to walk into either um but there's there's a cultural thing here where just people don't care i've seen literally people walk by the paintings that i have up right now has been getting like kind of a kind of visceral reaction people have been stopping because they're going okay wow like maybe the work is that good that it stops people but after the hundreds of shows like for someone to just walk by and not even look that says there's something maybe with that person but also culturally because i've i've seen it repetitively happen with with different people i just go oh wow you know we're still not here in this area specifically people don't that's not their thing and that's fair i'm not saying everyone needs to be interested in art for sure i I think it goes back to like your previous you know comments about marketing and like how to engage with users essentially right like if the same artwork no longer existed in this space but existed instead on like an influencer's instagram channel right maybe you have more engagement with the work digitally than you ever did in terms of like physical Physically, atten- attendance. Sure. And so I think like part of my like knock against the white cube space, and it's not even like a real knock, but it's just the idea that right now we're inviting alternative ways of looking at art. And I think we're dematerializing 
the kind of pedagogy that we have in our minds as to like what art is, how it's represented, how it's consumed, how it's traded, who buys it, who enjoys it, who it's for, you know, initially, and even who creates it. So um, I think like that's an exciting transition. And I think that people like those same people that are walking back and forth, they may be following like artists and stuff on Instagram. I doubt it. <laughs> I mean, you'd be surprised. I mean, there's, there's a lot of artists that have a pretty broad following. And I mean, people that start following me, like I, pretty random walks of life you know like i wouldn't have expected some of the people that follow me to follow me and it's for like sure they're getting something out of it and i think that's I, awesome. i think it's just the interaction i mean maybe maybe art because viewing art digitally is different than viewing it in the physical for sure it's always gonna be different and, um i think there's been a a certain type of kind of way which is changing like you know the, the gallery approaches. I, I think the galleries in the, in the next couple of years really need to clean up kind of their act in the sense of like this old way, like brick and mortars are clearly shutting down left and right. True. And I, um, I've seen a lot of spots also like open up like smaller sections within their gallery to do like project spaces, invite more, you know, young artists and stuff, try and get that attendance back up, try and get that engagement back up find a way to get new like followers and contacts. Cause like, you're right. If they just show like the same old stuff, that's like kind of been institutionalized and they're just kind of processing it the same way. Like people tune out. Yeah. And it's also the way, like I think uh, today to get people captivated, it's amazing how many people uh, not in the art world will tell me like, have you seen the Van Gogh experience? I got to see the Van Gogh experience in Miami when it was initially released. And That's stuff. everywhere now, right? It's like, yeah, kind no, of and it's like just a thing to do. Like, oh my gosh, how did you not go to the Van Gogh experience? I'm like, do you even know who Van Gogh is? Do you know his brother? You know Van Gogh? And they're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Van Gogh, I went to the Van Gogh experience. <laughs> I still have not been, but I've seen Van Gogh's and I feel like that's an experience in and of itself. But. No, I know. But it's just like when, when you're in the art world, when someone brings up like Picasso, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care. They just bring him up? No, like people, are like, what are your thoughts on Picasso? I just don't, I don't care. I mean, like you might just have beef with Picasso. No, I, don't I know. have no beef. Like if you, if you <laughs> were totally like, apathetic. if you were like Michael, I just got a Picasso. I'd be like, I'd be more interested of how did you get a Picasso? How did you even like acquire that? How yeah. did you get it? Right. Right. And th I think that's interesting. But I'm not, I'm not going to be prepared to have my mind blown. Like, Over Picasso. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. we've seen enough art. Like I'm not sure what moves the needle for you today. For me, I look at art. I'll talk about this artist I have in the showroom right now, Travion uh, Travion Payne. Um, I have, I'm having a show for him September 18th. Cool. I initially saw his work. I said, you know, technically it's pretty sound, but I need to see it in person. For sure. So I see it in person. I go, okay, there's there's some interesting stuff because now I'm I'm seeing the work. I'm seeing that there's a huge textural er element. You know, on the surface, it looks kind of like photorealism initially. But then when you really dive into the work, you realize like these are really painterly paintings uh, that we're actually looking at. Mm -hmm. And then the narrative and the story, because you go like, OK, at least for me, figurative work has always been like kind of a tough sell. So thinking on the business at like as a collector, as someone who's as like a collector. Yeah, okay. I find like the people who are going to be buying this work are more informed buyers than non-informed if that makes sense like they know something about art like there, gotcha. there's there's layers to this work like why is he painting these figures the way he is like this is the type of right. work in my opinion is not like a entry-level collector i mean yeah i guess i mean it's different strokes for different folks but for sure yeah no, no, but i'm right. saying i think you would find this shocking if i'm like oh yeah some you know person i mean I feel like figurative is pretty in right now. I feel like it'd be it could be in right now, but yeah. I'm saying like a lot of people say, why would I want that big, you know, figure of someone I don't know on my wall? Like, for sure. I'm saying the entry level person is not like normally there needs to be some type of like, OK, if this was sexy women, you know, just hot. I get it. Objectify. Know, just, objectify. Yeah, objectify. Cool. There's a cute. That's another. Pro that's cross promoting a whole different market, like selling sex, selling this. This yeah. stuff. I think that's a very like specific market too. Like I, I would argue that that's also not like for your entry level 
like I, I collector would, is probably I would agree, like but your, it at least cross promotes another market meaning someone could be just an utter like oh wow misogynist <laughs> yeah no i mean i had an artist um rest in peace uh john hall oh yeah i remember john hall who he came by a couple shows very amazing kind of like uh pinup art and kind of like airbrush stuff yeah. and i remember i did really well with him you know he had a huge he had a big following in vegas which yeah I think he had makes, a big makes, following that it makes made sense. sense yeah um and he was really really talented at doing that and like but when i look at travion's work there there's a story there's a narrative and me naturally getting to know the artist i kind of fell in love with his story his narrative and after i had heard it his works it it all clicked for me now my my whole point is sharing his story sharing his narrative sharing his ideas and getting it to the people who support and when you buy a painting of his you're supporting his career so you can continue to share his narratives and sure and some, sometimes that's what that's what it's about it's just like supporting people that you support and yeah i like sure. the sense of community around that i don't think it needs to be like this thing that becomes an asset class that's traded for hundreds of millions like even if it trades for the same price or it never trades again but you just have like a community now around what you do like that's hugely valuable a hundred percent i think like when a client buys a painting from me at least the way i see it is like hey by you patronizing not only helping my artists but you're helping me to continue to do shows continue to do what this community likes i don't think there's anyone who hasn't come to one of my shows and said oh wow that wasn't a pleasant experience or that was something fun yeah because they like it as something to do specifically because there's not as many galleries like you know out on Ventura Boulevard or whatever it is. It's like a cool spot to just come into. You know? Yeah, you come in, you enjoy, you have maybe a little wine, uh, interact with people that you wouldn't meet otherwise. For sure. that It's amazing over the years how many people have um, gone into business with other people that they've met at my shows. Oh, really? That's interesting. And it's, it's interesting because they don't know how they met, but I know how they met. I'm like... <laughs> they can't even remember. No, like I, I had a buddy, um, he brought one of his clients, uh, the client was not interested in any of the art, but he met a gal and they started a t-shirt company together. I'm like, oh yeah, I know this person way back. I'm like, nah, you guys, I remember you guys met in this office. Damn. You're sitting in my chair. That's my chair. My chair. Yeah. That's, so, my, that's my company now. <laughs> um, no. And, 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 you know, he invested in her project and even though it wasn't for the art and whatever, that was cool. You know, like, I think it's, it's kind of cool how like. I like to think about like art shows are like great networking events because like you're there to celebrate this kind of hopefully if you like it, you know, this artist and their work visually. I wish there was more engagement. Like I've gone to art shows now and it's more like some people make it more about them, like the person who just dresses like. You think visitors like that? Yeah, the actual people in the openings. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely become like a spectacle and like. You, you know it pays to be eccentric at those things i think that's like kind of how you lead into yeah. conversations and stuff but you know it is it is kind of become a networking event for certain people but it's also like a time for people who may be artists themselves or people who are collectors like to see art in person which i think is important and to kind of like celebrate that and talk about that and just connect with other people who enjoy that here's an interesting question do you think it's disrespectful for a performance artist to do a performance at someone else's show it, for a performance artist to just start yeah, performing. Yeah, you know, like a person some... who's wearing like a... Do I think it's disrespectful? The cookie monster outfit and walking around, you know, saying, I like cookies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like doing some some crazy shit like that. Because like, I've seen them I, at I, the art fairs. Definitely at the art fairs. I, I have kind of like a beef with some art fairs, so like I probably wouldn't be so mad at that, and I do see it more at art fairs than like actual... Yeah, because they, they just want to draw... I mean, the person doing the performance just wants a crowd. So exactly. Like, I'll go to an art fair, buy a $30 ticket, and dress like an idiot and scream around. And I got a show at the fair now. Yeah, <laughs> now, now I could say on my resume, I was at Scope and, and or wherever they yeah. were. For sure. I mean, I definitely think it's like... If it's if it's an artist show, like especially like a solo show or something, like and it's the opening, that that is disrespectful. I'm like, let that artist have their moment right now and let them have it on their terms. But if if it's you know something else that's not that, and the it also depends on the performance, right? If it's a if it's a shit performance, I'll be more offended. <laughs> I, I think I think it's just it's like it's amazing how people are just trying to you know climb up the clout or whatever. And I get it, climb you, up the clout. You got it. You gotta you gotta get it any way you can. I think it's interesting because 
I've noticed like a lot of those artists pop up because they're like, oh yeah, other people can videotape this and spread it. And like, there'll always be like some designer with a model. There's this one guy I'm forgetting as artist. I, he's bumped into my booth a couple of times. He's like this fashion guy and you'll have this model dressed in something either provocative or just something that, you know, you just have to like see and he'll, he'll just follow her around and be like, this is my art piece. She is. Yeah. Like, That's just like, like the, 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 the work, like the, 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 the garment that she's wearing is the piece. I mean, have a fashion show or something. It's just weird that it's like that one chick and then he like, no, it'll that. be something like crazy. Like, ah, oh, COVID. like I get it. They'll I be wearing it. a chain that says COVID or whatever, you know, yeah. it's just like, I mean, he's got a muse, you know. I mean, if it's if it's their thing and they're cool with it, they're cool with it. But no, but I, seems I think a little it's like me. wow, it's like you know, you pay twenty dollars to get into a show and then you just walk around. Like, hey man, teach your own piece. No, I mean, maybe it's, that's like their date night. That's like what they like to do. It's like <laughs> I, I think we we're just living in a time where everything is about how many eyeballs. Like, I I'm not interested necessarily in becoming famous ever. If it happens, I could understand that. It Please tune into Art Matter podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was a, it, it, it's a byproduct of something that I'm doing. Meaning, I'm still going to be the same person, really. If you saw me, like, you're like, yo, my boy Michael blew up. He has like 100 million followers, and he's super famous. Like, you'll still be able, like, whoever has access to me at that point. Like, obviously, I understand. I just can't service everyone in the world. That's just any human being. It but, becomes your work at a certain point. But no, I mean, if I have context with someone, we have a relationship. It's not like I'm going to be like, oh, man, Peace, can't talk man. to Josh anymore. Yeah. My clout level's too high. And I, I mean, I, I think, can't put anyone else on. I think the people who like end up getting the most famous now, especially through like social media and stuff, like are people who are just themselves. Like, you know, you, you get famous for really weird shit right now. Have you listened to Drake's new album? I was just listening to like one of the singles in the, in the car right away. I did too. Yeah, I'm. I haven't listened through the whole thing, so I won't speak on. I just finished uh, Donde, the Kanye's new new album. But was it good? Um, I, I think I liked it better than than the last one. But I'm I'm always. I have a confession. I only like uh, mainstream hits. Like if it doesn't, <laughs> that's a confession. I mean, that's good. That's why they're mainstream, right? That's like they're doing. No, their meaning job. like when we're like, oh man, you didn't listen to the album. Like, no, if it's not a mainstream hit, it's just not a good song. Like the mainstream ones are the ones that stick with me. Again, it's like following people, right? I mean, I follow Kanye because of college dropout. Like, I follow Kanye because yeah, there were some really music. solid hits in college dropout. Like a lot of them. Were I mean, hits. throughout throughout his whole career, there's been some solid solid hits. And like, I mean, even what he's doing now with like Adidas, or like that's a hit, you know? No, like, for sure. And I think that's what people don't realize about some mainstream hits. Like the cool. He's thing crazy is, a little bit, <laughs> but like no, you know, sure I feel like I have to preface myself. Like I like I have to apologize for my love for Kanye right now. Like that's the world. No, we're living I, I right love now. Kanye too. I think the interesting interesting thing for me is like when people go oh like i'm a music i'm a music enthusiast and like you didn't listen to this song on the album i'm like all the good songs good music like all the good music will be a mainstream hit because we're not tied in together looking at music like just it goes based off what people want to listen so like when you hear that song i love the nightlife to compare it to is like when a certain song comes on at the club and everyone goes yeah like because everyone resonates that feeling that song is giving them for sure I and mean, that's why it's like versus populist that, culture or like it's like pop art or pop music it's like it's it's algorithmically designed to but be, it's not like visual art in that sense because visual art like no but you could do stuff that's like pretty formulaic in terms of like visual art that will get kind of a mass approval in the same way that you can like choreograph like a, a song I think it's much harder though I don't think so. I mean, look at this. Put some some dots on it, colorful dots on a canvas. I mean, it's yeah, like certain stimuli. You know, you know what's so interesting about this, like dots on a canvas and stuff? It's like everyone who sees Talking this. Talking about painting, Damien Hurst, by the way. No, no, no. Yeah. It, it, you'll be surprised how many people are like, oh, I didn't like the, the, the like Damien Hurst is not bigger, will never be bigger than Kanye ever. Not in this life, not in the next. It's, I mean, it's a different genre, right? No, it's like, a different. So that's what I'm saying. Like, music is so accessible in that sense. Like, meaning. If I had to do a survey, do you know Damien Hurst or Kanye West? Kanye is going to take the cake like a hundred to one for sure. I mean, I, I just don't understand the point of that survey. You know, <laughs> no, like... the point of that survey is it, it says something about the art itself. Meaning, like, 
the visual arts realm has been something that's really hard to understand. And that's why I think in the upper echelon, they've made it like this, like exclusive club. Like, oh, you, you don't know how to see with your eyes. You can only like hearing is easier than seeing, I guess. For sure. That's I mean, what I'm saying. And, and it depends on the genre too. Like if, if you're looking at like pop art versus like hardcore, like underground jazz. Even pop art. Like, take, like who do you think is the hold most Hold up, man. Let me finish artist. the thought. But it's like, I'm just saying like comparing those two things, like you're probably gonna have a much easier time getting people to access like pop art than you would, you know, like an indie jazz group. And it's like, that's audible, but it's also just because they're doing things and trying to play with things and challenge things in music on a different level that only like an informed person would really be clued in on. But there, you used a really good example, jazz. I hate jazz, not a fan of it, don't care about it, right? Okay. Pop art, right? Even the top pop artists, like you could take Mr. Brainwell. Who's Who do you think is the number one pop artist that people know of? Warhol. Warhol, right? And he's dead, like living. Let's talk, let's compare living to living, dead to dead. Cause like- Banksy, maybe. Maybe Banksy, right? Like, we can look up Banksy's following. I'll put my money, I'll put my life on it that Kim Kardashian's more famous. Yeah, but like at the end of the day, like who cares? No, no. (laughs) So I'm saying no, that says something about the culture, meaning there's there's more of an interest. There there's never for some reason we haven't been able to create another Pablo Picasso in the last when did Picasso die in in uh i don't know his exact death date we'd have to we'd have was to get it the google. 90s was it the eight the let's late get a 80s? google let's fact let's check. let's fact check it here we go let's check it coming up died 1973 1973 yeah wow yeah yeah he was not alive in the 90s we no, no, no. I, I don't even know why i thought that but it's just like i should know better 1973 died 1973 yeah which makes sense because, like, if you see it, in no, his no work, it does. I, yeah. I, I was thinking, I was thinking for some reason in the eighties. I just thought because I know he lived a long he, life. He lived he, long. He did live a long time. Yeah. Nineteen seventy three, and we haven't, we haven't, we haven't created. Well, there's Warhol after him. <laughs> I mean, no, there's Warhol, but even Warhol. There's Keith Haring. Keith Haring was pretty huge. Keith Haring. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm, I'm talking about. No, Keith Haring and Basquiat, there's still people. The village idiot doesn't know who it is. I remember, I'll never forget this. Uh, we were having a party here at the gallery, and this girl was here. She was like, Picasso should really thank Kanye for putting him on. I'll never, this is real. This is like, Wait, Basquiat. This is a real story. Thomas will vouch for this, our buddy Thomas, who we know. She was like, We were talking about Kanye West's album uh pablo oh okay yeah yeah and um she thought kanye was more famous than pablo picasso <laughs> like she didn't realize that, Con- that kanye may argue that that like, album no that kanye's that- paying homage to Lin Picasso. <laughs> he is but i, I feel so, like he, he's he was, thinks he's the most famous artist of all time that's which, fine but it's like but she did a good job if, if i had if i if i had to ask most people in the world globally they know Everyone, when they say a little kid, like, oh, you're Picasso, you know, like it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a reference. And in the same way that like Van Gogh is now, but like he was a nobody in his life, you know, it's like nobody for knew sure. of him, but he was like, and so like, painter. I just think like we haven't created like Picasso is what's equivalent to the Michael Jordan in the basketball. He's equivalent to the Beatles and whatever, you know, I'm saying, yeah, I that mean- magnitude. We do get breakouts like that in the arts, but for sure it's less because like less. Sometimes. But you're looking at an asset class, like how much does it cost to buy a painting versus to listen to a song, right? Like you can listen to a song for free. Rarely can you buy a painting for free, right? So it's like your access to these things are far different in terms no, of- No, I know, but now we're them. changing that landscape, meaning we understand that you can see something visually. Like what do you think is the most famous piece of artwork? Just guess. Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa, right? You didn't even have to think very hard. To say that the Mona Lisa is probably the most famous artwork in the world. Yeah. I mean, there's a few up there for sure that are like in that iconic. There's up there. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. You know, there's there's a couple, you know, that we could definitely say, okay, like, what would be the next one other than the Mona Lisa? I mean, like like a Pollock painting, like 
probably people wouldn't be able to discern between one Pollock or another. To another, sure. But they'd be able to like, that's Pollock. That's or Pollock. like, that's, you know, uh, Warhol or, or something like that. Probably, Rothko, I, f- I would hope people would know, but I feel like that's more obscure than like I think he's up there. Pollock. I don't think they'll he's know the there. name. They'll know the work, though. They'll be like, oh, yeah, there's yeah. some guy who did whatever. In terms of marketplace, like, yeah, for sure. Rothko's yeah. like up there. And like in terms of like artistic merit and all that stuff, he's, he's definitely up there. Um, but... I think that's also just like the culture of the time, right? When these abstract expressionists came into the play in in the U.S., like that was you the U.S.'s like first real claim to fame in the arts. Like that was our kind of counterculture to Europe and saying we've designed our own kind of modernist painting, and we're playing off of certain things that obviously it was happening in the U.K. and in other places. But like we created like an art star. It was no longer about the painting. It was no longer about like the illusion of what that represented. It was about the bravado of the person making the painting. And like that's inherently more tied to fame than what you'd experience with like, you know, a Rubens or something like that, where that was really not the point. It was really just the skill and like the imagery that you were presenting on its own merit. Yeah. Um, but I think that culture is, is changing now because, as you said, it's so disseminated and so many people are just trying to fight for eyeballs. That like maybe we don't need to have like another Picasso. Maybe we don't need to have like another Jeff Koons. I don't think that it makes sense that you're going to get these like huge asset class pieces that rise to the top. There may still be some of that, but I think it'll be far less going into the next like century than it was in the, in the I previous think, century. I, I think we're going the other way, meaning because of the accessibility now and the interest like NFTs. I think this is where NFTs are actually... There's going to be a couple more Beeple stars, you know, like the fact like Beeple... If he continues to, you know, interest the masses, it pays to be the first. So people goes True. down as, you know, I am king of the NFTs. I am God of NFT. He gets he gets that. Yeah. But I mean, like he had like really not much of an art career prior. That's fine. And but it's he, like, yeah, he got that one. That's his time. Yeah. So he did one piece. And I think like for him, like it he, just takes one sometimes for sure. And, and and that's what I'm saying. It's like for him, <coughs> he, he may dip and do something else after this. I mean, 50, 60 billion or billion million dollars will free up your life a little bit. Is, you know? Isn't there that artist like Daniel uh, Cho or something? The, the one oh, who from was, Facebook. Yeah. Like I could care less about the dude's art. But he got paid out 200 mil. No, no, so I know. Like, so I was looking at like top artists. He doesn't artists. care either right now. No, no, I know. He's on like one of the top like best artists. And it's not by the virtue of his art. It's just his net worth. I mean, yeah. I mean, anyone could put a blog together and rank people. But I think that that's like a pretty shallow metric if that's the only metric you're going no i mean, I've, I've no, it's, it's I've no sad knock that against I've seen him, that, that me- metric played out multiple times. And you just look up most successful artists and you look at what that criteria is like, okay, how much money are they making? For sure. And unfortunately, like in this country, especially like success yeah. is really monitored just off of hundred percent like monetary value, you know? And I think if there's a way to change it is kind of the time we're living in now. We're at the hour right now. At the hour. We're, we're definitely going to have to do another podcast. Yeah, this was fun. I like this little tequila. Josh will probably become uh, yes, a, yes, we, art did, tech. we <laughs> did, uh, we did uh, a little bit of a tasting here before the, the, the podcast uh josh where can we plug you in where can people find your your creations what you're doing uh you can find everything on my site jhashemzada.com or spell follow it out for them yeah yeah that's h-a-s-h-e-m-z-a-d-e-h.com or you can just follow me at jhash93 on instagram that's j-h-a-s-h-93 on instagram and uh yeah i'll see you there thanks again and thanks guys for tuning in can't wait to see you guys on our next episode peace Thank you so much for tuning into the Art Matcher podcast. We had an interesting discussion, a great time, and we hope you did too. Please tune in for next week's episode and like, share, and follow. For more information about the app, you can check out our website at artmatcher.com or look us up on social. Stay safe and be artful.